Section 46 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 2, Section 46, Essay on Matthew Arnold, by George Edward Woodbury. Matthew Arnold, an English poet and critic, was born December 24th, 1822, at Lelham, in the Thames Valley. He was the son of Dr. Thomas Arnold, best remembered as the master of rugby in later years, and distinguished also as a historian of Rome. His mother was, by her maiden name, Mary Penrose, and long survived her husband. Arnold passed his school days at Winchester and Rugby, and went to Oxford in October 1841. There, as also at school, he won scholarship and prize, and showed poetical talent. He was elected a Fellow of Oriel in March 1845. He taught for a short time at Rugby, but in 1847 became private secretary to Lord Lansdowne, who in 1851 appointed him school inspector. From that time he was engaged mainly in educational labors, as inspector and commissioner, and travelled frequently on the continent, examining foreign methods. He was also interested, controversially, in political and religious questions of the day, and altogether had a sufficient public life outside of literature. In 1851 he married Frances Lucy, daughter of Sir William Whiteman, a judge of the court of Queen's Bench, and by her had five children, three sons and two daughters. His first volume of verse, The Strayed Reveller and Other Poems, bears the date 1849. The second, Empedocles on Etna and Other Poems, 1852. The third, Poems, made up mainly from the two former, was published in 1853, and thereafter he added little to his poetic work. His first volume of similar significance in prose was Essays in Criticism, issued in 1865. Throughout his mature life he was a constant writer, and his collected works of all kinds now fill eleven volumes, exclusive of his letters. In 1857 he was elected Professor of Poetry at Oxford, and there began his career as a lecturer, and this method of public expression he employed often. His life was thus one with many diverse activities, and filled with practical or literary affairs, and on no side was it deficient in human relations. He won respect and reputation while he lived, and his works continue to attract men's minds, although with much unevenness. He died at Liverpool on April 15, 1888. That considerable portion of Arnold's writings, which was concerned with education and politics, or with phases of theological thought, and religious tendency, however valuable in contemporary discussion, and to men and movements of the third quarter of the century, must be set on one side. It is not because of anything there contained that he has become a permanent figure of his time, or is of interest in literature. He achieved distinction as a critic and as a poet. But although he was earlier in the field as a poet, he was recognized by the public at large first as a critic. The union of the two functions is not 
unusual in the history of literature, but where success has been attained in both, the critic has commonly sprung from the poet in the man, and his range and quality have been limited thereby. It was so with Dryden and Wordsworth, and less obviously with Landor and Lowell. In Arnold's case there is no such growth. The two modes of writing, prose and verse, were disconnected. One could read his essays without suspecting a poet, and his poems without discerning a critic, except so far as one finds the moralist there. In fact, Arnold's critical faculty belonged rather to the practical side of his life, and was a part of his talents as a public man. This appears by the very definitions that he gave, and by the turn of his phrase, which always keeps an audience, rather than a meditative reader, in view. "'What is the function of criticism at the present time?' he asks, and answers, "'A disinterested endeavour to learn and propagate the best that is known and thought in the world.' that is a wide warrant. The writer who exercises his critical function under it, however, is plainly a reformer at heart, and labors for the social welfare. He is not an analyst of the form of art for its own sake, or a contemplator of its substance of wisdom or beauty merely. He is not limited to literature or the other arts of expression, but the world, the intellectual world, is all before him where to choose. And having learned the best that is known and thought, his second, and manifestly not inferior duty, is to go into all nations, a messenger of the propaganda of intelligence. It is a great mission, and nobly characterized. But if criticism be so defined, it is criticism of a large mould. The scope of the word conspicuously appears also in the phrase which became proverbial, declaring that literature is a criticism of life. In such an employment of terms, ordinary meanings evaporate, and it becomes necessary to know the thought of the author rather than the usage of men. Without granting the dictum, therefore, which would be far from the purpose, is it not clear that by critic and criticism Arnold intended to designate, or at least to convey, something peculiar to his own conception, not strictly related to literature at all, it may be, but more closely tied to society in its general mental activity? In other words, Arnold was a critic of civilization more than of books, and aimed at illumination by means of ideas. With this goes his manner, that habitual air of telling you something which you did not know before, and doing it for your good, which stamps him as a preacher born. Under the mask of the critic is the long English face of the gospeler, that type whose persistent physiognomy was never absent from the conventicle of English thought. This evangelizing prepossession of Arnold's mind must be recognized in order to understand alike his attitude of superiority, his stiffly didactic method, and his success in attracting converts in whom the seed proved barren. The first impression that his entire work makes is one of limitation. So strict is this limitation, and it profits him so much, that it seems the element in which he had his being. On a close survey the fewness of his ideas is most surprising, though the fact is somewhat cloaked by the lucidity of his thought its logical vigor, and the manner of its presentation. He takes the text 
either some formula of his own or some adopted phrase that he has made his own, and from that he starts out only to return to it again and again with ceaseless iteration. In his illustrations, for example, when he has pilloried some poor gentleman, otherwise unknown, for the astounded and amused contemplation of the Anglican monocle, he cannot let him alone. So, too, when, with the journalist's knack for nicknames, he divides all England into three parts, he cannot forget the rhetorical exploit. He never lets the points he has made fall into oblivion. And hence his work in general, as a critic, is skeletonized to the memory in watchwords, formulas, and nicknames, which, taken all together, make up only a small number of ideas. His scale, likewise, is meagre. His essay is apt to be a book review or a plea merely. It is without that free elusiveness and undeveloped suggestion which indicate a full mind and give to such brief pieces of writing the sense of overflow. He takes no large subject as a whole, but either a small one, or else some phases of the larger one, and he exhausts all that he touches. He seems to have no more to say. It is probable that his acquaintance with literature was incommensurate with his reputation or apparent scope as a writer. As he has fewer ideas than any other author of his time of the same rank, so he discloses less knowledge of his own or foreign literatures. His occupations forbade wide acquisition. He husbanded his time, and economized also by giving the best direction to his private studies, and he accomplished much. But he could not master the field, as any man whose profession was literature might easily do. Consequently, in comparison with Coleridge or Lowell, his critical work seems dry and bare, with neither the fluency nor the richness of a master. In yet another point this paucity of matter appears. What Mr. Richard Holt Hutton says in his essay on the poetry of Arnold is so apposite here that it will be best to quote the passage. He is speaking in an aside of Arnold's criticisms. They are fine, they are keen, they are often true, but they are always too much limited to the thin, superficial layer of the moral nature of their subjects, and seem to take little comparative interest in the deeper individuality beneath. Read his essay on Heine, and you will see the critic engrossed with the relation of Heine to the political and social ideas of his day, and passing over with comparative indifference the true soul of Heine, the fountain of both his poetry and his cynicism. Read his five lectures on translating Homer, and observe how exclusively the critic's mind is occupied with the form as distinguished from the substance of the Homeric poetry even when he concerns himself with the greatest modern poets, with Shakespeare, as in the preface to the earlier edition of his poems, or with Goethe in reiterated poetical criticisms, or when he again and again in his poems treats of Wordsworth. It is always the style and superficial doctrine of their poetry, not the individual character and unique genius which occupy him. He will tell you whether a poet is sane and clear, or stormy and fervent, whether he is rapid and noble, or loquacious and quaint, whether a thinker penetrates the husks of conventional thought which mislead the crowd, whether there is sweetness as well as lucidity in his aims, 
whether a descriptive writer has distinction of style or is admirable only for his vivacity but he rarely goes to the individual heart of any of the subjects of his criticism he finds their style and class but not their personality in that class he ranks his men but does not portray them hardly even seems to find much interest in the individual roots of their character in brief this is to say that arnold took little interest in human nature nor is there anything in his later essays on byron keats wordsworth milton or gray to cause us to revise the judgment on this point in fact so far as he touched on the personality of keats or gray to take the capital instances he was most unsatisfactory arnold was not then one of those critics who are interested in life itself and through the literary work sees on the soul of the author in its original brightness or set forth the life stains in the successive incarnations of his heart and mind nor was he of those who considered the work itself final and endeavor simply to understand it form and matter and so to mediate between genius and our slower intelligence he followed neither the psychological nor the aesthetic method it need hardly be said that he was born too early to be able ever to conceive of literature as a phenomenon of society and its great men as only terms in an evolutionary series he had only a moderate knowledge of literature and his stock of ideas was small his manner of speech was hard and dry there was a trick in his style and his self-repetition is tiresome what gave him vogue then and what still keeps his more literary work alive is it anything more than the temper in which he worked and the spirit which he evoked in the reader he stood for the very spirit of intelligence in his time he made his readers respect ideas and want to have as many as possible he enveloped them in an atmosphere of mental curiosity and alertness and put them in contact with novel and attractive themes in particular he took their minds to the continent and made them feel that they were becoming cosmopolitan by knowing joubert or at home he rallied them in opposition to the dullness of the period to barbarism or other objectionable traits in the social classes and he volleyed contempt upon the common multitudinous foe in general and from time to time cheered them with some delectable examples of single combat it cannot be concealed that there was much malicious pleasure in it all he was not indisposed to high-bred cruelty like lamb he loved a fool but it was in a mortar and pleasant it was to see the spectacle when he really took a man in hand for the chastisement of irony it is thus that the seraphim illuminati sneer and in all his controversial writing there was a brilliancy and unsparingness that will appeal to the deepest instincts of a fighting race willy-nilly and as one had only to read the words to feel himself among the children of light so that our withers were unwrung there was high enjoyment this liveliness of intellectual conflict together with the sense of ideas was a boon to youth especially and the academic air in which the thought and style always moved with scholarly self-possession and assurance with the dogmatism of enlightenment in all ages and among all sects with serenity and security unassailable from within at least this academic clearness and purity without shadow or stain 
had an overpowering charm to the college-bred and cultivated, who found the rare combination of information, taste, and aggressiveness in one of their own ilk. Above all there was the play of intelligence on every page. There was an application of ideas to life in many regions of the world's interests. There was contact with a mind keen, clear, and firm, armed for controversy or persuasion equally, and filled with eager belief in itself, its ways, and its will. To meet such personality in a book was a bracing experience, and for many these essays were an awakening of the mind itself. We may go to others for the greater part of what criticism can give, for definite and fundamental principles, for adequate characterization, for the intuition and the revelation, the penetrant flash of thought and phrase. But Arnold generates and supports a temper of mind in which the work of these writers best thrives even in its own sphere. And through him this temper becomes less individual than social, encompassing the whole of life. Few critics have been really less disinterested. Few have kept their eyes less steadily upon the object. But that fact does not lessen the value of his precepts of disinterestedness and objectivity. Nor is it necessary in becoming a child of light to join in spirit the unhappy remnant of the academy, or to drink too deep of that honeyed satisfaction with which he fills his readers of being on his side. As a critic, Arnold succeeds if his main purpose does not fail, and that was to reinforce the party of ideas, of culture, of the children of light, to impart not moral vigor, but openness and reasonableness of mind, and to arouse and arm the intellectual in contradistinction to the other energies of civilization. The poetry of Arnold, to pass to the second portion of his work, was less widely welcomed than his prose, and made its way very slowly. But it now seems the most important and permanent part. It is not small in quantity, though his unproductiveness in later years has made it appear that he was less fluent and abundant in verse than he really was. The remarkable thing, as one turns to his poems, is the contrast in spirit that they afford to the essays. There is here an atmosphere of entire calm. We seem to be in a different world. This fact, with the singular silence of his familiar letters in regard to his verse, indicates that his poetic life was truly a thing apart. In one respect only is there something in common between his prose and verse. Just as interest in human nature was absent in the latter, it is absent also in the former. There is no action in the poems, neither is there character for its own sake. Arnold was a man of the mind, and he betrays no interest in personality except for its intellectual traits. In Clough, as in Obermann, it is the life of thought, not the human being, that he portrays. As a poet, he expresses the moods of the meditative spirit in view of nature and our mortal existence, and he represents life not lyrically by its changeful moments, nor tragically by its conflict in great characters, but philosophically by a self-contained and unvarying monologue, deeper or less deep in feeling and with cadences of tone, but always with the same grave and serious effect. He is constantly thinking, whatever his subject or his mood. His attitude is intellectual. His sentiments 
are maxims, his conclusions are advisory. His world is the sphere of thought, and his poems have the distance and repose, and also the coldness that befit that sphere. And the character of his imagination, which lays hold of form and reason, makes natural to him the classical style. It is obvious that the sources of his poetical culture are Greek. It is not merely, however, that he takes for his early subjects Melope and Empedocles, or that he strives in balder dead for Homeric narrative, or that in the recitative to which he was addicted he evoked an immelodious phantom of Greek choruses, nor is it the marmorial air that chills while it ennobles much of his finest work. One feels the Greek quality not as a source, but as a presence. In Tennyson, Keats, and Shelley there was Greek influence, but in them the result was modern. In Arnold the antiquity remains, remains in mood, just as in Landor it remains in form. The Greek twilight broods over all his poetry. It is pagan in philosophic spirit, not Attic, but of a later and stoical time, with the very virtues of patience, endurance, suffering, not in their Christian types, but as they now seem to a post-Christian imagination, looking back to the imperial past. There is a difference, it is true, in Arnold's expression of the mood. He is as little Sophoclean as he is Homeric, as little Lucretian as he is Virgilian. The temperament is not the same, not a survival or a revival of the antique, but original and living. And yet the mood of the verse is felt at once to be a reincarnation of the deathless spirit of Hellas, that in other ages also has made beautiful and solemn for a time the shadowed places of the Christian world. If one does not realize this, he must miss the secret of the tranquillity, the chill, the grave austerity, as well as the philosophical resignation which are essential to the verse. Even in those parts of the poems which use romantic motives, one reason of their original charm is that they suggest how the Greek imagination would have dealt with the forsaken merman, the church of Baru, and Tristram, and Isolt. The presence of such motives, such mythology, and such Christian and chivalric color in the work of Arnold does not disturb the simple unity of its feeling, which finds no solvent for life, whatever its accident of time and place and faith, except in that Greek spirit which ruled and thoughtful men before the triumph of Christianity, and is still native in men who accept the intellect as the sole guide of life. It was with reference to these modern men, and the movement they took part in, that he made his serious claim to greatness, to rank, that is, with Tennyson and Browning, as he said, in the literature of his time. My poems, he wrote, represent on the whole the main movement of mind of the last quarter of a century, and thus they will probably have their day, as people become conscious to themselves of what that movement of mind is, and interested in the literary productions that reflect it. It might be fairly urged that I have less poetical sentiment than Tennyson, and less intellectual vigor and abundance than browning yet because i have perhaps more of a fusion of the two than either of them and have more regularly applied that fusion to the main line of modern development i am likely enough to have my turn as they have had theirs if the main movement had been such as he thought of it or if it had been of importance in the long run, there might be a sounder basis for this hope 
than now appears to be the case. But there can be no doubt, let the contemporary movement have been what it may, that Arnold's mood is one that will not pass out of men's hearts to-day nor to-morrow. On the modern side the example of Wordsworth was most formative, and in fact it is common to describe Arnold as a Wordsworthian. And so, in his contemplative attitude to nature, and in his habitual recourse to her, he was. But both nature herself, as she appeared to him, and his mood in her presence, were very different from Wordsworth's conception and emotion. Arnold finds in nature a refuge from life, an anodyne, an escape. But Wordsworth, in going into the hills for poetical communion, passed from a less to a fuller and deeper life, and obtained an inspiration, and was seeking the goal of all his being. In the method of approach, too, as well as in the character of the experience, there was a profound difference between the two poets. Arnold sees with the outward rather than the inward eye. He is pictorial, in a way that Wordsworth seldom is. He uses detail much more, and gives a group or a scene with the externality of a painter. The method resembles that of Tennyson rather than that of Wordsworth, and has more direct analogy with the Greek manner than with the modern and emotional schools. It is objective, often minute and always carefully composed, in the artistic sense of that term. The description of the river Oxus, for example, though faintly charged with suggested and allegoric meaning, is a noble close to the poem which ends in it. The scale is large, and Arnold was fond of a broad landscape, of mountains and prospects over the land but one cannot fancy Wordsworth writing it. So, too, on a small scale, the charming scene of the English garden in Thyrsus is far from Wordsworth's manner. When garden walks in all the grassy floor with blossoms red and white of fallen may and chested flowers are strewn, so have I heard the cuckoo's parting cry from the wet field through the vexed garden trees, come with the volleying rain and tossing breeze. This is a picture that could be framed, how different from Wordsworth's wandering voice. Or to take another notable example, which, like the Oxus passage, is a fine close in the Tristram and Isolt, the hunter on the heiress above the dead lovers. A stately huntsman clad in green, and round him a fresh forest scene. On that clear forest knoll he stays, with his pack round him, and delays. The wild boar rustles in his lair, the fierce hounds snuff the tainted air. But lord and hounds keep rooted there. Cheer, cheer thy dogs into the brake, O hunter, and without a fear by golden-tasseled bugle blow. But no one is deceived, and the hunter does not move from the arras, but is still rooted there, with his green suit and his golden tassel. The piece is pictorial, and highly wrought for pictorial effects only, obviously decorative and used as stage scenery precisely in the manner of our later theatrical art, with that accent of forethought which turns the beautiful into the aesthetic. This is a method which Wordsworth never used. Take one of his pictures, the Reaper, for example, and see the difference. The one is out of doors, the other is of the studio. The purpose of these illustrations is to show that Arnold's nature pictures are not only consciously artistic, with an arrangement that approaches artifice, but that he is interested through his eye primarily, and not through his emotions. It is characteristic of his temperament also 
that he reminds one most often of the painter in water colors if there is this difference between arnold and wordsworth in method a greater difference in spirit is to be anticipated it is a fixed gulf in nature wordsworth found the one spirit's plastic stress and a near and intimate revelation to the soul of truths that were his greatest joy and support in existence arnold finds there no inhabitancy of god no such streaming forth of wisdom and beauty from the fountain heads of being but the secret frame of nature is filled only with the darkness the melancholy the waiting endurance that is projected from himself yet faust of the mute turf we tread the solemn hills about us spread the stream that falls incessantly the strange scrawled rocks the lonely sky if i might lend their life a voice seem to bear rather than rejoice compare this with wordsworth's stanzas on peel castle and the important reservations that must be borne in mind in describing arnold as a wordsworthian will become clearer it is as a relief from thought as a beautiful and half physical diversion as a scale of being so vast and mysterious as to reduce the pettiness of human life to nothingness it is in these ways that nature has value in arnold's verse such a poet may describe natural scenes well and obtain by means of them contrast to human conditions and decorative beauty but he does not penetrate nature or interpret what her significance is in the human spirit as the more emotional poets have done he ends in an antithesis not in a synthesis and both nature and man lose by the divorce one looks in vain for anything deeper than landscapes in arnold's treatment of nature she is emptied of her own infinite and has become spiritually void and in the simple great line in which he gave the sea the unplumbed salt estranging sea he is thinking of man not of the ocean and the mood seems ancient rather than modern the feeling of a greek just as the sound of the waves to him is always aegean in treating of man's life which must be the main thing in any poet's work arnold is either very austere or very pessimistic if the feeling is moral the predominant impression is of austerity if it is intellectual the predominant impression is of sadness he was not insensible to the charm of life but he feels it in his senses only to deny it in his mind the illustrative passage is from dover beach ah love let us be true to one another for the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams so various so beautiful so new hath really neither joy nor love nor light nor certitude nor peace nor help for pain this is the contradiction of sense and thought the voice of a regret grounded in the intellect for if it were vital and grounded in the emotions it would become despair the creed of illusion and futility in life which is the characteristic note of arnold and the reason of his acceptance by many minds the one thing about life which he most insists on is its isolation its individuality in the series called switzerland this is the substance of the whole and the doctrine is stated with an intensity and power with an amplitude and prolongation that set these poems apart 
as the most remarkable of all his lyrics. From a poet so deeply impressed with this aspect of existence, and unable to find its remedy or its counterpart in the harmony of life, no joyful or hopeful word can be expected, and none is found. The second thing about life which he dwells on is its futility. Though he bids one strive and work, and points to the example of the strong whom he has known, yet one feels that his voice rings more true when he writes of Obermann than in any other of the elegiac poems. In such verse as The Summer Night, again, the genuineness of the mood is indubitable. In The Sick King of Bokhara, the one dramatic expression of his genius, futility is the very centre of the action. The fact that so much of his poetry seems to take its motive from the subsidence of Christian faith has set him among the skeptic or agnostic poets, and the main movement which he believed he had expressed was doubtless that in which agnosticism was a leading element. The unbelief of the third quarter of the century was certainly a controlling influence over him, and in a man mainly intellectual by nature it could not well have been otherwise. Hence, as one looks at his more philosophical and lyrical poems, the profounder part of his work, and endeavors to determine their character and sources alike, it is plain to see that in the old phrase, the pride of the intellect lifts its lonely column over the desolation of every page. The man of the academy is here, as in the prose, after all. He reveals himself in the literary motive, the bookish atmosphere of the verse, in its vocabulary, its elegance of structure, its precise phrase, and its curious allusions involving footnotes, and in fact throughout all its form and structure. So self-conscious is it that it becomes frankly prosaic at inconvenient times, and is more often on the level of eloquent and graceful rhetoric than of poetry. It is frequently liquid and melodious, but there is no burst of native song in it anywhere. It is the work of a true poet, nevertheless, but there are many voices for the muse. It is sincere, it is touched with reality, it is the mirror of a phase of life in our times, and not in our times only, but whenever the intellect seeks expression for its sense of the limitation of its own career and its sadness in a world which it cannot solve. A word should be added concerning the personality of Arnold, which is revealed in his familiar letters, a collection that has dignified the records of literature with a singularly noble memory of private life. Few who did not know Arnold could have been prepared for the revelation of a nature so true, so amiable, so dutiful. In every relation of private life he is shown to have been a man of exceptional constancy and plainness. The letters are mainly home letters, but a few friendships also yielded up their hoard, and thus the circle of private life is made complete. Everyone must take delight in the mental association with Arnold in the scenes of his existence, thus daily exposed, and in his family affections, a nature warm to its own, kindly to all, cheerful, fond of sport and fun, and always fed from pure fountains, and with it a character so founded upon the rock, so humbly serviceable, so continuing in power and grace, must wake in all the responses of happy appreciation and leave the charm of memory. He did his duty as naturally as if it required neither resolve nor effort nor thought of any kind for the morrow, and he never failed, seemingly, in act or word of sympathy, in little or great things, and when to this one adds the clear ether of the intellectual life where he habitually moved in his own life apart, 
and the humanity of his home, the gift that these letters bring may be appreciated. That gift is the man himself, but set in the atmosphere of home, with sonship and fatherhood, sisters and brothers, with the bereavements of years fully accomplished, and those of babyhood and boyhood, a sweet and wholesome English home, with all the cloud and sunshine of the English world drifting over its roof-tree, and the soil of England beneath its stones, and English duties for the breath of its being. To add such a home to the household rights of English literature is perhaps something from which Arnold would have shrunk, but it endears his memory. End of section 46. Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio.